good morning. Welcome to week five of Leviticus. You've made it this far. Uh, far further than most people have made studying Leviticus, so I congratulate you uh, and thank you uh, for coming, attending, putting up with me. Uh, it's really been a huge encouragement that you guys have come uh, each week to hear me talk about Leviticus. Uh, so hopefully you are still doing the reading and will continue uh, to do the reading uh, through the book of Leviticus even after we're done. Uh, I think you'll probably have a little bit left after today. Uh, so today we are covering, uh, if you remember my illustration, I talked about the structure of Leviticus being sort of like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That you have two slices of bread on the outside that correspond with each other. You have uh, a layer of peanut butter on both of those pieces of bread. This is for someone who really likes peanut butter. Uh, and then in the middle, you have the sweet, gooey center, the, the jelly, right? Um, I also referenced it, made it kind of look almost like a mountain, uh, that there's corresponding sides to the mountain, uh, but the pinnacle, the peak of the mountain is in the middle of the book. And so we are going to be in Leviticus chapter 16, uh, and today we're going to be in only Leviticus 16. We're not covering big sections, so just one chapter today. Uh, so this is the Day of Atonement. Uh, in later on in, in Judaism, this was just simply referred to as the day. Uh, it was that important to them. Uh, so this also combines why it's sort of there in the middle and why I think it's maybe the most important part is that it combines all the other sections. So at first we looked at the sacrifices, then we looked at the priests, then we looked at cleanliness, and here in the Day of Atonement, it, it incorporates all those previous sections, combines them all into one very important uh, chapter. Now, last week, we talked about cleanliness. And it would be really easy coming away, coming out of that, to just kind of feel overwhelmed. Uh, the amount of commands that the Israelites were dealing with would have been crushing. Uh, the, the holiness that they were uh, called to have was to permeate every area of their life. It was their food, it was their family life, their sex life, how they would interact with other people. Uh, it saturated every moment of their life. There was no break from it. It was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year until they died. Uh, and so just the amount of stress that they could be under, the amount of guilt that they could have, just because, I mean, if you guys are like me, I'm not perfect. I, I miss stuff sometimes. There's always things that kind of slip through the crack. And so there was always this sense of crushing guilt. Um, and I think Christians especially can deal with guilt sometimes. Uh, I read this week that on average, uh, a normal person has a total of about five hours of guilt every week. Uh, and I dare say that Christians may have more than that because we are called to live a holy life. We of all people have uh, more of a reason to live uh, upright and a righteous life. Uh, we know better than to sin. Uh, and we have the spirit within us. And so all of that when we do sin and if you're like me, you sin often on a daily basis, uh, there is just an overwhelming sense of guilt. This had to be something that the Israelites also understood. The guilt would be constant and it would be crushing. Uh, and so this particular chapter is immensely important for that reason. Uh, before the Day of Atonement, there's really not a lot about how God would deal with Israel's sin. Before this, uh, God had revealed to Moses back in Exodus that he is a forgiving God, that he would forgive their sins, but he hadn't really revealed how he would deal with all their sins. Now in chapters 1 through 7, we saw that the sacrifices, they atone for the people's sins, uh, but those are specifically for their unintentional sins. And this we see in the Day of Atonement, this is to cover all of their sins, all their uncleanness, all their guilt. So this is indeed the pinnacle 
the sweet, savory center of really the entire Pentateuch, that God is a God who forgives. He will do something about people's sin, all their sin. So uh, what exactly is atonement? Um, our word for atonement comes uh, from the Old English that is, you could break it down from the word itself as at one uh, It's being at one with God that God has found a way to uh, forgive our sins, to reconcile us to him so that we can then have fellowship with him. Uh, we learned how Leviticus is all about God coming and dwelling with his people, and he makes that possible by atoning for their sins. Uh, so I'm going to do something I haven't normally done, and that's pray uh, before we get started. I always end up forgetting that, so I want to do it this time, the last time, if nothing else. So. Let's pray, uh, and then we'll dive into the text. Heavenly Father, we praise you, God. You are a holy God uh, and also a loving God. You have uh, gone out of your way to seek to dwell with your people despite their sinfulness, uh, despite our sinfulness, and you have made a way, uh, God, to make that possible through atoning for our sins, for bearing them yourself. God, we pray that you would help us to come to grips with that, to be able to uh, have peace uh, with you through uh, Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who bore our sin on the cross. God, give us wisdom as we uh, encounter this text. Help us uh, clear our minds and to uh, just have ready and open hearts to receive your word, to see that it is profitable, uh, even when it's from Leviticus. Uh, and God, I pray that it would bear fruit in our hearts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so Leviticus chapter 16. Uh, would anyone be able to read just verses 1 and 2? All right. Go ahead. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of two of Aaron's sons when they approached the presence of the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he may not come whenever he wants to, once into the holy place behind the curtain in front of the mercy seat on the ark, or else he will die, because I appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So the chapter opens with the occasion. So if you remember back when we covered uh, the priests, uh, we talked about Nadab and Abihu. These were the two sons of Aaron who offered strange fire. Uh, to the Lord, who when they went into the tabernacle, the fire of the Lord came out that had just consumed their sacrifice, accepted their sacrifice, and here judged uh, Nadab and Abihu and consumed them and killed them. Uh, so this is the, the ground. Uh, this is why God is giving this. This is when they would go into the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle. If you remember the diagram I drew, the layout, uh, you had the tabernacle, it's kind of rectangular. If you went inside, uh, there would be this uh, kind of larger room uh, that was just called the holy place. Uh, but there was on the other side of that room a large veil, very thick veil, embroidered with cherubim. And if you went in behind that, that was called the holy of holies. It was a smaller room, and in it was only the Ark of the Covenant inside and that's where God's presence would dwell between the cherubim that were molded onto the top of the Ark of the Covenant. So this is when uh, the high priest would go into this room. It was only once a year. So this is the occasion and it, it lists how Aaron should go about doing this. Uh, now these first few uh, verses just kind of outline, give a summary of how to enter um, and it was so that Aaron would not die. He had, it would have been very fresh in his mind, uh, the death of his own two sons uh, and God's judgment on them because God is a holy God. And so uh, this probably would have been pretty terrifying for Aaron, the prospect of going in behind the veil now. Uh, so God said it would be, uh, he would give this to them so that he would not die. And in future generations, surely familiarity would breed contempt. Uh, God has come down from the mountain and the fire and the flame and the thunder and the lightning uh, and come and dwelt among them 
but that doesn't mean that he's their homeboy and, and they can take their relationship with him lightly. He is still to be regarded as holy. Uh, would someone read now verses 3 through 6? Uh, and this is just the, the beginnings, the preparation. <clears throat> but in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. So in the preparation to go in, he first gets five animals. So he gets a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Those are for himself. Uh, and then he gets two goats uh, for sin offerings from the people. And one of those goats is going to be special. It's going to be set aside. We'll see about that in a moment. Um, and then also one ram for burnt offering. So three offerings from the people and then two offerings for himself. Um, <clears throat> and then he, he takes, you remember the, the really elaborate clothes that the high priest has? We talked about that a little bit, uh, that were made for beauty and for splendor. They were like heavenly garments almost. Uh, on all other days, the high priest looks like a king arrayed in gold and precious stones, uh, very elaborate clothing, and yet this day he sets all that aside. Uh, and this day he is just a simple servant of the Lord of glory. Uh, in fact, his clothes on this day are probably less than that of the average priest. Uh, their clothes were more elaborate than his on these days. So these are very plain clothes uh, that he takes on and all the, the sort of heavenly garb he sets aside for this time, and it says he bathes himself uh, before he puts these on. Uh, so the next thing, I'll just summarize this, uh, is that he casts lots over the two goats for the sin offering that he got from the people. This is in verses 7 through 10. Uh, so one of the goats is to be for the Lord, and then the other one is for Azazel. Uh, now, some of your translations say Azazel. If you have a King James that says uh, one will be for a scapegoat. Okay, so modern translations are they're split on exactly what to do with this particular Hebrew word. They, they just transliterated the Hebrew word Azazel. That's what it is in the Hebrew. So it could be translated for a goat of departing. Hence, that's where we get the idea of scapegoat. It's an e-scapegoat, the goat that leaves, that departs. Um, so that's the older translations. Um, but it could be translated as a proper name. And this is where they're a little divided. Uh, some people think, actually, that this is a demon, uh, a goat demon. And so the idea then is they put, so in the scapegoat ceremony, as we see, uh, the high priest confesses all the sins of the people and puts them on the head of the goat and then sends the goat out to Azazel. And so the idea is they're taking all their sins and their uncleanness and sending it back where it came from is, is almost the idea. Now, uh, there's issues. Uh, hopefully, you, you know, you think that sounds a little weird um, because... It could easily have been misunderstood, especially in later generations, that this was maybe some kind of a gift to this evil spirit, uh, if that's what it was. In fact, in uh, 17, chapter 17, verse 7, uh, God says, you're, you're going to bring your sacrifices to the tabernacle so you no longer sacrifice to goat demons. Uh, it mentions that. And so God, just in the next chapter, says, no, 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 nothing with these goat demons anymore. So it seems unlikely and would be really weird if God said, yeah, you're going to send this goat to this goat demon. Okay? So that is probably, I would say, the most unlikely one. The other option, if it is a proper name, it could be a location. Um, the word could be translated 
to the rough terrain. Uh, so out in the wilderness is what it says, is where the goat is sent, that it's some rocky, craggy area that the, the goat would go uh, and perhaps die. Uh, in later Jewish traditions, they would actually throw the goat off the side of a cliff uh, to make sure that it didn't come back into uh, the camp. Uh, there's one really funny uh, Aramaic translation I translated for a class of mine, where it says there's this whirlwind, a tempest of the Lord comes and picks up the goat, and hurls it into the wilderness, and kills it. Uh, it's very bizarre. Uh, so either way, uh, whether it's the goat of departing, that it's just simply the goat that goes out, or if it's uh, the goat that goes to this place called Azazel, what is clear is that this goat is going to be bearing the sins of the people out away from the camp. So the next thing that happens is that Aaron goes in uh, behind the veil. He offers sin offerings, uh, cleansing everything uh, for himself and for the people. So in verse 11, it says, Aaron shall, be, shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. So this follows the same procedure as the sin offering back in Leviticus chapter 4. The only difference is in chapter 4, he would take the, the blood and sprinkle it in the holy place before the altar of incense. In the Day of Atonement, he goes in behind the veil in front of the Ark of the Covenant and sprinkles the blood there seven times. So he's going further into the tabernacle, further into the presence of God. Now before he does this, uh, verse 12, he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, two handfuls of sweet incense, beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may of the mercy, sorry, the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he does not die. So what he does is he he takes the incense into a censer, it's like a, a pan, and he takes it and hangs it inside the holy of holies before he actually goes in, kind of reaches around the veil and hangs it in. And the smoke from the incense uh, fills the whole room, and so it creates sort of the smoke screen, because especially later on it says that the, the Jews couldn't even look at the holy, of thing, holy things inside the tabernacle lest they die. And so this is the danger, looking on the presence of God. Uh, so it creates a smoke screen so he can't see, and that's how he's able to go in and offer the blood. So he sprinkles the blood of his own sin offering. So he atones for himself with the bull, uh, and he sprinkles that on the mercy seat. He sprinkles his offering and the people's offering on the mercy seat. Now mercy seat, um, just to be clear, it's not literally like a, a chair or a stool or something. Um, it's literally a lid that would cover the Ark of the Covenant. That was referred to uh, in modern translations as the mercy seat. It could be translated just the place of atonement or atonement lid. Uh, the idea of seat probably comes from uh, Psalm 99. It refers to, to God being enthroned between the cherubim in reference to his presence being there on top of the atonement lid, uh, if you will, or the mercy seat, that it's God's throne. So this is the place of mercy where atonement was made, and it's where God's presence dwelt. Uh, and the ark contained, just as a reminder, the Ten Commandments, the law of God. This is the standard that the people were to live by. And in the ark, there were two other things. Uh, there was a jar of manna, the bread that would come down from heaven, and then the rod of Aaron that had budded almond uh, flowers. Uh, and both of those were actually reminders of Israel's rebellion. Uh, the occasion for the manna, the whole reason for manna, is because they were ready to stone Moses. They were complaining and angry with him because they had come out into the wilderness. Now they were going to starve, and they missed the meat pots and the cucumbers and the melons of Egypt. 
Uh, and so God had them place that reminder of their rebellion in the ark there with the, the tablet of the commandments. And the staff was also uh, a reminder of the people's rebellion when they question God's choosing Aaron to uh, be a priest. And that's how God revealed to them, proved to them, no, he is really my chosen vessel. He is going to be my high priest. So it's that mercy seat, that ark, that Aaron is sprinkling the blood on top of. So he offers the sin offering for himself first, and that uh, allows him to be able to come in and then make atonement for the people. He represents them before God. Uh, so then in 15, that covers where he offers the, the goat for the people. Uh, and then verse 16, thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sin. So this is how he makes atonement through the blood. Uh, in the next chapter, God says, you're, you're not going to eat blood because life is in the blood and it's the blood that I have given to make atonement on the altar for my people. So this is uh, the, the first half, if you will. Um, so, oh, sorry, I forgot. So he sprinkles the blood on the ark first, but he actually goes and then sprinkles the blood on the tabernacle and everything in the tabernacle, and he goes out to the altar and sprinkles that as well. So he's cleansing everything from the people's uncleanness and from their rebellion. So that is the first uh, part of the ritual. So now we move to the second part. So this concerns the scapegoat. So would someone read verses 20 through 22? When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess it over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. Okay, so the, the goat for Azazel is now presented. So they already took care of the goat for the Lord. That was the one that was sacrificed for the people and the blood sprinkled. And so now the other goat that the people had presented is brought to Aaron. Uh, and it says that he put both hands, before on other offerings it was only one hand. Uh, this time he puts both hands on the animal's head and he confesses then all the sins of the people, which may have taken a while, uh, just considering the amount of sin that can happen. Uh, but he confesses over it and he, it says he puts the sins on the goat's head and then they have this man in readiness, uh, that's how my translation puts it, uh, who is ready with the goat, and they send it off into the wilderness, and it bears the sin of the people away into a desolate place. Uh, so atonement happens kind of in these two parts in, in this chapter. You have the blood that's sprinkled on the mercy seat, but there's also atoning through bearing the sin away out of the camp. Uh, and we see also from this, I just want to point out, that confession is very much tied in to atonement. Uh, Aaron the priest would stand there confessing the sins of the people, making it known, essentially saying, Lord, we have sinned against you, we agree with you that we deserve your judgment, but we are asking now for mercy. So confession goes hand in hand with atonement here. So after this, that's about it. Uh, there's a little bit of cleanup that happens in verses 23 uh, through 28. Aaron then comes back into uh, the tent of meeting. He takes off the garments. He puts, or he bathes himself. He puts on the priestly garb again, uh, the garments <coughs> for beauty and for glory. And then he offers two more offerings. He gives two burnt offerings. Remember, these are in fellowship. So they, they've gotten the fellowship, and so now he worships God through offering these sacrifices. The guy who was the man in readiness, who sent the goat to Azazel, uh, he also would wash himself uh, and then be able to come into the camp. And then the, the different parts, if you remember uh, the sin offering, 
part of the animal was taken outside of the camp and burned. And so the last few verses then uh, of 27 and 28 deal with them uh, finishing up the sin offerings with those animals. Uh, and then there's this last part uh, that's sort of a postscript. Uh, and this is verse 29 through the end of the chapter. And it says, And it shall be a statute for, to you forever, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves, and shall do no work, either the native or the sojourner, who, uh, or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. And then it kind of gives a last little summary in verse 31 uh, through 33. And then it says in verse 34, And this shall be a statute forever that you, uh, for you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once a year, once in the year, because of all their sins. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. So this last little tying up. So uh, just three quick things. So they're supposed to afflict themselves, uh, probably uh, in the rest of the Bible, how afflicting themselves is, is through fasting usually. Um, so I know we're Baptists in here, but maybe you know uh, what this is. If you know what Lent and uh, Ash Wednesday is, uh, this is something that historically the church has celebrated leading up to Easter. And it was a time sort of a preparation where they would fast, they would repent, uh, and it was this preparing themselves to consider then the atonement of Christ and Easter. So it's kind of similar to that, that there's this time of repentance and confession uh, that goes hand in hand again with this atonement. Uh, and this is something God says, it shall be a statute to you forever. Uh, so they continue to do this uh, in generations to come. Um, it specifically also says it was a Sabbath. Uh, so it would have been very clear to the people that atonement did not happen through them working. This whole thing was them just, they, they offer their uh, few sacrifices to Aaron, and then Aaron goes and does all the rest of the work himself. Um, so <clears throat> there's also then uh, this commandment that it shall be for both the native and the stranger. So it was for Jew and Gentile alike that they were to celebrate this uh, feast, or not feast, I guess, this particular festival. Uh, so if you were a Gentile, you were sojourning, you happened to be temporarily among the Israelites during this time, you would be included as well. So this is the Day of Atonement. Now, I thought it would be helpful if we have time uh, just to think a little bit. Uh, if you're familiar with Hebrews, uh, this will be relatively easy if you need a little help. Uh, flip over to Hebrews chapter 9, uh, verse 11 uh, and following. But I wanted to think, okay, we know that uh, the Old Testament looks forward to Jesus. And it's a little bit difficult because the, the Day of Atonement isn't explicitly mentioned in the New Testament. But I, I hope you see that there are similarities between Jesus and what Aaron is doing. And so I wanted to do a little compare-contrast. I'll, like almost this entire time that we'll be going through this, it's just me up here like a fire hose talking. And so I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to discuss some of this, to think through, okay, how does the high priest, how is he similar to Jesus? And also, how is he different from Jesus? Uh, and like I said, Hebrews can help you out uh, with this in chapter 9. So any ideas? How is Jesus similar to Aaron in this chapter? Just similar for us. Then we'll do different. Uh, in each case, they take the offering on our behalf or the people's behalf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's operating on behalf of us, not for himself, because he needs no sin offering. Uh, so that's okay, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but I am. Uh, he doesn't have to offer a sin offering for himself like Aaron does, because he doesn't have any sin. 
So he's in, acting entirely on behalf of his people. He lowers himself, taking off the priestly garments and putting on the collar. Yeah, this is beautiful to me, uh, that he sets aside the, the kind of heavenly garb and picks up those of a servant. Uh, in Philippians 2, there's mention of Christ setting aside, uh, and I, I want to be careful here because there's possibility for heresy, um, but he, he sets aside all the things uh, of heaven, and he takes on flesh, right? Uh, John says he, be, he became flesh and he tabernacled among us. It's literally what, what he says. He dwelt with us, uh, and he came as a servant to operate on our behalf. What else? Well, with the idea of the scapegoat, uh, you have the idea of the sins of the people transferred to the sacrifice. And that's what happens uh, with Christ's mm -hmm. death. Uh, the sins of his people are transferred to him, and then he bears the punishment mm -hmm. uh, of his people. Yeah, so he's actually similar to more in this passage than just Aaron, more than just the high priest, because he's also the offering itself. He's both that sin offering that died, shed his blood uh, to make cleansing atonement, but he's also the scapegoat. Our sins are transferred, imputed to him, we would say in the New Testament, and then he bears those sins away. In uh, Isaiah 53, which is uh, the song of the suffering servant, servant uh, in verse 4 it says, Surely he has borne our griefs. This is scapegoat uh, imagery and language that Isaiah is using. Uh, in verse 6, he says, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's hearkening back to uh, the scapegoat. And the New Testament also makes clear Christ bears our sin. Anything else? Well, he's cleansing more than just the people, right? Yeah, Aaron does. What else does he clean? The tabernacle and everything in it. Uh, there's kind of an unusual verse in uh, Hebrews uh, 9, verse 23, that it talks about the heavenly tabernacle. So there's uh, God gave the plans for the tabernacle on the mountain, and they were uh, a mirror of the heavenly tabernacle. And it says in he, uh, Hebrews 9, verse 23, that the heavenly tabernacle also needed to be cleansed. I'm not sure why, uh, but that is a, a parallel, a similarity. Jesus also cleansed a tabernacle. Anything else? All right, so how is uh, Jesus different from Aaron? I already mentioned that he off, you know, Aaron offers a sin offering for himself, but Jesus doesn't need to do that. Uh, we also mentioned how he acted as a high priest, but he was also the offering itself, and he was the sin offering and the scapegoat. He did it once. Yeah, that's uh, the big one that uh, Hebrews touches on, is that this was the perpetual statute, right? They were supposed to do this forever. Uh, year after year, Aaron would have to go in behind the veil and offer uh, cleansing, but Jesus only did it once. His offering is superior. Anything else? All right. Oh, do you have one? Yeah. Well, I guess, it's, I guess it says that he brings it to the mercy seat. He goes into the holy, most holy place, a tent made with hands, and uh, Christ enters into uh, the very presence of God itself, not into uh, an earthly tabernacle, but into the presence of God yeah. to make intercession for us. Yeah, and that also is something that Hebrews touches on in that how Jesus is superior. He didn't just go to an earthly tabernacle. He went to the, the real one, the heavenly one. Uh, to make atonement on our behalf. Okay, so, uh, I mean, this is the Day of Atonement. This is the, the sweet, savory center that God forgives. 
Uh, he calls us to be holy, but he makes all that possible. And even when we fail in that, he makes cleansing on our behalf. Um, I just wanted to, to make a couple of quick points, just trying to kind of tie everything together. Just the main points that I've been trying to make uh, uh, throughout this, uh, these lessons. So the first thing is that God works toward dwelling with his people. He doesn't just wait for them to come to him. He goes down to them. We saw that in how God came down the mountain. When the people refused, when they were afraid, God essentially says, okay, I'll come down to you. And so he go, comes down and dwells in the tabernacle. He did it for the first time here in Leviticus. Since the fall, he, uh, this is the first time he dwells with his people. He did it again in Jesus. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. He didn't wait for us to be good enough. He came to us even in our sin. It's what he currently does with us in the Holy Spirit. We have God with us inside of us. And he will one day do it again when Jesus returns. We see this in Revelation. Uh, that uh, God will dwell with us and he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Uh, so God is intentional to dwell with his people. Uh, the, the whole basis of the command for them to be holy is God's holiness. This is the, the second thing. Uh, that's the basis. So the people must strive for holiness because God is holy. Uh, the whole structure, I think, actually, of Leviticus may reflect this. So think about it for a sec. So we looked at the sacrifices, then we looked at the priesthood. And at that section on the priesthood, that's when God accepts their sacrifices, their offering. But what has he not given them yet? The cleanliness laws. You would think, okay, they would have to be clean first for God to accept them. But instead, he accepts their sacrifices. He accepts them then he gives them the cleanliness laws. And so the basis of their cleanliness, the whole reason why they should be clean, is because God has come to dwell among them. Uh, the, the theology, if you will, precedes the practice. This is who God is. So now you live this way. This is something reflected really well in Ephesians uh, that we've been covering on Sunday mornings. The first half of the book in chapters 1 through 3 is all about theology. This is who God is. This is what he's done. He has adopted you. He has brought you into his family. And then chapters 4 through 6 is, okay, now this is how you should live in response to that, in gratitude. And that's even what we see here in Leviticus. Uh, and then the last thing is that uh, holiness only happens first by atonement. Like, I, I want to be clear, your, your basis for any holiness, uh, any righteousness of your own is because God has... has accomplished atonement on your behalf but there's also effort uh, that goes into the holiness the people were to be assiduous very careful uh, in being holy to God and I think this is also something you see in the New Testament Philippians uh, chapter 2 is a great example of this in verse 12 Paul says therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed so now not only as in my presence but much more in my absence Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Be intentional. Be thorough with your own salvation, working out that holiness. And then he gives the basis. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So God's uh, acting in us uh, goes hand in hand with us acting also along with him in seeking our holiness. They're not mutually exclusive. You have to have both. Okay, so any uh, questions or comments? Uh, we don't have a ton of time, but I wanted to get your all's feedback maybe uh, from this, if there was anything you learned from your reading, from the lesson, any questions you have, anything that wasn't clear, uh, just anything at all. Nothing? Nobody ready to jump at the opportunity? If not, that's okay. Anything maybe you notice from this lesson uh, that I may have missed? Yes, sir? Is there a connection between, uh, this is a slightly random connection, <clears throat> the scapegoat going to the wilderness carrying the sin, uh, and the idea of this, 
this demon guy, the goat demon. Um, and I, I, in my mind, I, I connect that to Jesus putting demons into pigs. And it seems to be kind of a, uh, is, this, is there any connection between those two sorts of ideas? Not that I know of. That's not something that I read uh, in any of the commentaries or sources that I cited. Someone did reference uh, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, now, this is debated in scripture, uh, but it, there's a line that says he descended into hell. Uh, they tied that in with the scapegoat imagery, and that if it is a Zazel, that he took the sin back where it came from uh, and then was resurrected, if that makes sense. But I'm not sure about, you know, casting out the cliff. Which is interesting, yeah, and they die. Yeah. This is a bunch of Canadians. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I didn't read anything about that. Anything else? I thought it was interesting that the tabernacle is supposed to be a mirror image of, of what goes on in heaven and God's earth. Mm. Yeah. And um, you know, just the preparation that they're supposed to do to be able to have fellowship with God through that representation. Yeah. This is the king of the universe that they were going before. It wasn't, you know, I, I just think sometimes, like, if you ever had the chance to meet the president, regardless of what you think of any of the presidents, if you had the opportunity to meet them, you wouldn't go in being sloppy and ill-prepared. Like, you would be very careful to, you know, look nice, smell nice, you know, rehearse your lines of what you would say, and you would be nervous about this. Uh, and so I think... Uh, in the same way, there's great care that goes into going before God as well. Anything else at all? All right, we need to go ahead and pray. So we've got to get out there. Well, let's pray, and we'll be finished. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for uh, these weeks that we've been able to consider your word and be able to see how it is profitable. Uh, for our salvation. It's able to equip us for every good work. God, I pray that uh, just in coming weeks, uh, we would have an increased uh, appreciation for your word, uh, a desire to know it, to hide it in our hearts so we might not sin against you. Uh, and God, make us holy people. God, uh, we desperately need to be holy, uh, just in a world that is so sinful, so lacking of holiness, so sinful, so uh, guilt-ridden. God, uh, make us holy people that we may be lights uh, to the world around us, uh, and proclaiming uh, your goodness, your holiness, uh, and your atonement that you offer for all people. Pray that you be with us now as we go to the service. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.